Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in um, for the SEG Women's Network Committee webinar. I want to thank Ming Wong and Shelley Oakley for making this possible today. Uh, we're really excited to have Maria Daphne Mangriotti joining us today. Uh, she is a research associate at the University of Edinburgh, UK, currently working on CODA wave interferometry of acoustic emissions. She completed her uh, BA in geology, physics, mathematics at Brown University and master's in geotechnical engineering and a PhD in applied seismology at the University of California and Berkeley. She's worked as an academic researcher and industry consultant for characterization and monitoring in both near surface and reservoir applications. Thanks so much, Maria Daphne, for, uh, for your presentation today. She will be presenting and then at the end taking questions. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of the Zoom and we will be uh, answering questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and uh, for, uh, for this opportunity to present today. Um, so um, I will just before I begin, I, I want to um, namely um, give credit to all the contributors of uh, this presentation. Um, Andrew Curtis from the University of Edinburgh, who is a collaborator uh, in my project now. Um, Jonathan Sink, um, who is at the University of Strathclyde, both in the UK. Um, Anne Oberman at uh, SED at Eha Zurich. And Celine Hadzioanu at uh, the University of Hamburg. And um, special thanks to uh, Jonathan Singh and Anne Oberman for um, um, preparing a lot of these slides that uh, you will be seeing today. So um, just to go through uh, an outline of this talk, um, I will first introduce the concept of uh, multiple scattering and uh, coda waves. And um, further on explain um, how we can use Coda wave and interferometry to monitor changes in the subsurface um, as a result of the, their sensitivity to changes in the medium, including uh, velocity changes, uh, look, uh, locations of sources, and locations of scatterers. Um, I will go through um, a more theoretical formulation for coda wave interferometry, including other methods such as uh, coda wave decorrelation, and um, explain how we can use uh, sensitivity kernels uh, to localize all this information in the coda uh, uh, spatially and in time through inversions. Um, and finally, I will um, talk a lot about um, different uh, applications um, that are uh, multi-scale in the lab and in the field and in a uh, just very broad range uh, of um, uh, context. So looking both at um, um, properties of the subsurface, of um, uh, materials and civil uh, infrastructure. So let's uh, start with um, uh, the, the simplest. Uh, concept which is uh, coda waves and um, this here is a, um, a um, definition by Aki 1969 a very famous seismologist that I think is very concise and precise so um, he says coda waves are interpreted as backscattering waves from numerous heterogeneities distributed uniformly in the earth. Okay, so obviously uh, Aki was looking at um, uh, global uh, seismology and um, here I just want to, you, uh, to show to you um, a seismogram uh, from an earthquake near uh, Jan Magen Island. And what you see is um, quite clearly in this record is uh, an arrival of a P wave, your primary wave, followed by your uh, shear wave, uh, um, surface waves, which are uh, quite um, um, of large amplitude. And then following that, um, you have these uh, reverberations, uh, this very long tail of, let's say, um, lower amplitude, but still higher amplitude than the uh, pre event noise levels, okay? Um, and um, sorry, just to say that um, for the longest of time, 
um, these coda waves at the end of the record where um, were seen as sort of uh, noise or, or, or some things that are happening after uh, the, the record. Uh, and they were not really, uh, not really used uh, for a long time. Um, now, when we try to think of the, the processes that give rise to heterogeneity, so obviously Aki says, um, you know, you, you have these uh, heterogeneities in the earth and because of uh, scattering, uh, you know, all these multiple arrivals uh, end up in, at the end of your record. So let's just um, think of, um, you know, basic principles of uh, seismic wave propagation and imagine you have an incoming seismic wave uh, encountering a heterogeneity. Okay, so what happens there? Um, so if you start in geophysics, um, a very useful uh, mathematical tool is, is um, uh, this concept of uh, array. Okay, so uh, this is precise for um, an assumption of infinite frequency. Okay, and aside from a mathematical tool, uh, it's also valid um, if your seismic wavelength, so uh, lambda uh, would be equal to um, uh, uh, velocity, your seismic velocity uh, divided by your uh, dominant frequency. Uh, center frequency. Uh, so if you're, if that seismic wavelength is much and an associated Fresnel zone is much smaller than, than the size of your heterogeneity, then you are uh, within uh, the ray theory limits. Okay. In practice, um, what you have is a bounded uh, uh, frequency in your, uh, in your seismic wave. Um, so now um, if you have um, uh, your seismic wavelength of a similar order of magnitude as um, uh, the length of these heterogeneities, uh, you start to get uh, scattering phenomena. Okay, so uh, scattering theory is, is used to, uh, to describe any, any sort of um, non-ray um, geometrical uh, phenomena. So let's look at um, scattering theories. Um, firstly, I, I want to uh, explain the concept of uh, single scattering versus uh, multiple scattering. So uh, you may have heard of um, the weak scattering condition, which assumes you've got a uh, homogeneous uh, background and then you have some sort of heterogeneity uh, that is uh, weak. So uh, the, it doesn't have elastic properties that are too different from the background. And under uh, this condition, um, you can derive um, um, what is called uh, uh, the firstborn approximation, which uh, essentially says um, an incoming um, uh, seismic wave will only interact with a, um, a heterogeneity once and, and lead to single scattering. And because you have the, this weak scattering condition, um, in fact, um, uh, your um, outgoing uh, wave energy will be much uh, smaller than, your, um, than, than the incoming uh, wave energy. Okay, so while this um, single scattering theory is not what we observe um, in, in our earth materials um, and the earth, um, it is an okay uh, description of scattering phenomena in what we call um, short lapse time. So if you are um, um, near the beginning of your recording, um, uh, sequence um, and, and, and you will observe a lot of this uh, single scattering um, uh, right after, for example, your direct wave arrivals. Um, so the, uh, the next step is to consider um, scattering and um, in this case uh, what you have is your incoming uh, seismic wave is interacting with a scatterer and sends off uh, a scattered wave which interacts with the, with the next scatterer and so on. So you can imagine um, essentially the waves are bouncing all around um, and uh, these um, multiple bounces uh, constitute a phenomenon that which we call uh, multiple scattering. So um, just to say Obviously, there is a, um, a, um, a strong component of uh, uh, 
stochastic processes um, uh, to describe this sort of phenomenon because it's a very complex phenomenon. Um, and there are um, numerous um, analytical models that have been tried, uh, that have tried to address uh, this complex uh, phenomenon. And I will just flag here uh, some of these models that are commonly uh, used, so such as uh, the mark of approximation, um, which essentially uh, uses single scattering and a, and a wave envelope, um, the diffusion approximation, um, which um, pretty much um, uh, yeah, you, you can understand uh, intuitively, um, it, it, it tells you uh, that the seismic wave energy is very concentrated at the beginning, but as you enter in this um, heterogeneity zone, uh, that uh, seismic energy begins to get distributed um, in space. Uh, so you, you can sort of imagine uh, some ink being uh, dropped um, into uh, a glass of water. So this is sort of an, an, the analogy of uh, the diffusion approximation. And um, finally, a more um, a rigorous uh, approach is, um, uh, the, is um, using this uh, radiative transfer approximation, uh, which is um, valid at all distances. Whereas, for example, this uh, diffusion approximation um, predicts our observations well only if we are far from this uh, variation. Um, so there is a lot of um, intricate mathematics involved, and I'm not claiming to um, understand all of it or being able to explain all of it in, in just this uh, section, but I just want you to um, be aware that we have all these approximate schemes uh, that are valid for specific conditions depending on the medium or depending on the source receiver configuration or even at which time in the, um, in the record are we analyzing. And um, uh, this is a quite a good paper by Wegler et al. Uh, just to show uh, a comparison of the different schemes um, and how they can be used. So I, I mentioned before in, in the scattering regime, you have your um, incoming wave energy being slowly diffused. So um, I think this is a very useful diagram to explain um, what, what we mean by this um, energy di uh, diffusion. So uh, this is your uh, recording time um, normalized by something that is called the, um, uh, the free scattering path time. Um, so what you see is if you have initially um, uh, um, your total energy being one, um, in time uh, the, the direct wave will start uh, to diminish, okay, so the energy of your dir direct wave goes down and then in the beginning of your record you will start getting uh, single scattering events and then slowly the, the energy of those will diminish. And in the long term, what you're going to get is uh, an increase in this uh, multiple scattering energy. And of course, um, this is, uh, you know, this, if you go on infinite, in infinite time, it, it, would, it would plateau out to the original energy uh, you put in the system. Um, but that's, of course, if you assume uh, there is um, no absorption, uh, um, so, um, you're not losing any energy uh, to heat. So let's look at um, 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 a schematic of the, how we generate coda in our records. So to the left, I have a, a source, and to the right, I have a receiver. And let's we imagine we have a homogeneous medium with these um, point scatterers in blue. So you're going to record something that looks like this. And at the beginning of your record, it makes sense you're uh, seeing uh, your direct wave, um, which travels through the um, uh, shortest uh, time path. And then as time goes on, um, you start seeing um, um, multiple scattered energy, okay? So um, why are we, um, why did we start to use uh, coda waves, okay, rather than just uh, throw them away as we did in the beginning? And uh, I think the, um, the, the, the key, let's say, aha moment came when, when uh, seismologists and, and other scientists from other fields uh, realized that 
quota waves sample the entire medium, whereas, for example, uh, a direct wave would only um, uh, sample a finite extent of our medium. Um, another uh, factor is that uh, they repeatedly sample the same region. So, um, you know, there, imagine, for example, this multiple bounce, it could bounce up uh, five times before it decides to take off and, and you know, go off to another point. So um, as a result of this um, uh, repetitive bouncing back and forth, um, they're actually very sensitive to small changes in the medium. And realizing that, you know, the, the sensitivity of quota waves, um, what scientists realized was, okay, we can actually monitor very small changes because of this sensitivity of quota waves um, that wouldn't otherwise uh, be uh, uh, recoverable with other techniques. So now that um, I've given you an overview of um, uh, why um, it's, it's a good idea to look at uh, quota waves, I will just um, go through you, um, through the you um, go through with you um, the different aspects where we can use uh, quota wave interferometry and what type of uh, parameters we can um, uh, analyze. So um, just to um, give um, a, a definition of quota wave interferometry. So interferometry is looking at interferences, okay, and, and we're applying it to quota waves. So it's the uh, interference of quota waves between pairs of signals, okay? And we can use um, quota wave interferometry for monitoring um, either velocity perturbations of the medium, uh, looking at um, source displacement. So you observe a source and later on you observe another source and you can tell um, um, the distance between these two sources. And it can also be used uh, to evaluate displacement of, of scatters. So let's look at the velocity perturbation. Okay, so this would amount to having uh, initially all your medium being uh, gray, and then um, uh, at a later time, your velocity changes, uh, and, and this is sort of seen in the green uh, region. And, and this could be both a local effect as well uh, a more uh, global velocity change. The second is um, what we um, um, said was the source separation. So here is your source uh, initially and you record and then you have another source and you uh, record. And finally, um, you have uh, the displacement of scatterers. So um, you record the, um, the coda waves for um, the medium having the blue scatterers, and then by some mechanism, those scatterers move to the yellow position. So now you record uh, something different, and you're trying to understand how did the scatterers change um, in these two records. So looking again at um, velocity perturbation, let's now think of what um, this uh, velocity perturbation to uh, do to the waveforms, okay? So here we have again our, our uh, record at the green uh, receiver. And what we observe um, is uh, here you're seeing um, uh, a baseline trace and a monitor trace. So the trace recorded when we have um, homogeneous velocity and scatters and the monitor trace being what we record where we have this velocity perturbation added onto the system. So if you look at early on in the record, um, those two traces uh, fall on top of each other. Okay, uh, because they mainly sample the direct arrival, which will contain some time shift, which is um, depending on on the on the velocity perturbation itself. So, in my case, I've I've used a very small velocity perturbation, so we're not really seeing much of a shift. Okay, but as you move on in time. Uh, because you're going through a larger um, distance in this uh, um, velocity, in this um, updated velocity medium, uh, you're now going to have um, uh, larger time shifts in your record. 
And um, how can we now uh, quantify this um, uh, velo velocity perturbation and, and, and say how much has uh, the velocity changed? Um, so um, there, is, there are several techniques to measure time shifts. Uh, I will just present the, the trace stre uh, stretching technique. And um, this is uh, introducing also the uh, um, this coda wave interferometry theory derived by Snyder. Um, so this is our record again. And what we will do is we will window different parts of the coda, okay? And we're going to uh, look at the cross correlation between our unperturbed signal and then our perturbed uh, signal. And we will cross correlate um, for a range of values of epsilon. Epsilon is a stretching factor. So we can start, for example, by uh, using the unperturbed and perturbed without stretching, and then start to um, uh, uh, vary the stretching and see what uh, the cross correlation um, coefficient is. And once we reach the maximum cross correlation, uh, this means uh, we've achieved um, uh, the optimum uh, time shift, which maximizes uh, the correlation coefficient. And now this um, stretching factor can be directly linked uh, to um, um, the change in velocity over the original velocity. Okay, so here is how somebody would do this in practice. Um, you know, you start on with this, with this window. This is the time shift you measure. You then look at the time shift at another window and so on. Um, and finally, you know, you have this plot of time shift versus time. And if it's a uh, homogeneous velocity change through the entire medium, then, you know, everything will uh, line up in a line and you can uh, use that to assess the global velocity change or look at slopes um, uh, uh, at individual uh, segments to, um, to, to get a velocity uh, estimate as a function of um, travel time. Um, now, why would you go through this uh, pain of doing all that? Uh, why not just stick to something simpler as, for example, uh, first break picking um, to look at um, um, P wave um, velocities and S wave velocities and so on. And um, the key to, um, to let's say, uh, the benefit of using uh, this more painful technique rather than a, a simple first break picking is the fact that quota waves are much more sensitive to these velocity changes. And um, uh, Sincatel have shown, um, uh, we can actually see an order of magnitude in the velocity estimate between quota wave interferometry and first break velocity estimate. And, and, the, and the way they, they did that, they said, okay, my delta V over V, the smallest velocity change from CWI I can measure is actually equal to the sampling uh, time divided by uh, the maximum um, um, duration of my, of my record where, where the quota waves are. Um, and and, and the, the, the smallest velocity change I can estimate from first break picking is again, this the sampling time divided by um, 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 the first break time of, of my arrival, okay? And, um, this is putting um, the previous equations to the test, okay? So this is from uh, a real uh, lab experiment conducted by Singh et al, um, where they have um, warmed a, uh, a sample, a rock sample, and then afterwards uh, they allow it uh, to cool back uh, to room temperature, okay? So um, they used um, uh, first break picking in this case, and they try to, you know, these are the red point measurements from the different, um, uh, from the different arrivals, deduced from the different first break arrivals. Um, and here you're seeing 
using the same uh, sensors, again, the same samples. These are um, at the bottom, the deduced uh, velocity variations uh, measured uh, with this coda wave interferometry method. So it's very clear to me that um, the, ver the ver velocity variation um, is really not resolved above the noise in the case of first break picking, but it is without a doubt um, resolved uh, using quota wave interferometry. So um, I'm going to sweep under the carpet for now. Um, two very important points. Okay, so firstly, um, this idea of whether um, what we're measuring uh, with coda wave interferometry is uh, a global property or a local, like a, a global or a local perturbation. And also, uh, the second aspect is, uh, what is this change in velocity that we're measuring? Because if you think about coda waves, um, uh, they are describing, um, you know, multiple uh, wave bounces. And we know that every time a wave um, uh, encounters that heterogeneity, um, you may also get uh, some uh, converted waves. So it could be that, you know, some wave hits and it's a P wave and then it hits back, uh, it comes out as an S wave, okay? so. Um, what is this, what does coda wave respond to? Is it uh, VP or is it uh, the change in VS, okay? And um, there have been both uh, um, um, uh, theoretical studies as well as um, some um, experiments to try to understand this behavior. So based on the model by Sneeder, uh, 2002, if we know uh, the Poisson ratio, we can predict what um, change in velocity our uh, coda waves will be measuring as a function of uh, time in, in your record. So if you measure the velocity change right at the beginning of your uh, record, you're going to see uh, uh, more of this uh, P wave, and then if you wait longer, you're going to see more of your um, S wave. And um, uh, this is then, um, um, sorry, this is what your um, um, coda wave interferometry uh, will show, okay? So in theory, if someone has a, uh, a, an estimate of the Poisson ratio and they do their measurements and they look at um, how the velocity changes with time, then uh, they could come out and say, okay, uh, this is the change in velocity in P wave versus change in velocity uh, in S wave. Now, beyond that, um, we can also um, uh, resolve um, velocities locally uh, through what I, um, I will introduce later on, um, uh, 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 localization inversion, okay? Now let's look at the next phenomenon that coda wave uh, interferometry can be used for, and this is to determine uh, source separation. So imagine you have your source here and you have um, uh, your, your one of the coda waves arriving here and one of the other coda waves uh, bouncing off here and again arriving at your receiver. And now what happens if you, um, if you have a new source recorded at this receiver and how is that going to change uh, your coda waves? So um, it, it, um, both from a theoretical aspect and modeling aspect, what we see is that um, you will get a resulting change in uh, waveform shape because of this, uh, uh, of this change in uh, velocity uh, location. And um, the mathematics developed uh, by Sneder um, in, in his model uh, state that if you look at the cross correlation between um, one uh, source record and the other source record, um, you can link the cross correlation, uh, the maximum cross correlation coefficient to uh, the uh, variance of the travel time perturbations uh, in this, uh, of these scatterers. And then in turn, this variance of this, uh, the travel time perturbations uh, will depend on the source distance, R, um, and another function that depends on uh, alpha and beta, the uh, VP and uh, VS velocities, 
okay? In other words, I measure uh, the record from one source, I measure the record from the other source, I cross-correlate the two, I get my maximum cross-correlation coefficient, and now I can link it with some assumptions uh, to my uh, uh, source distance. Okay, now um, the limitations uh, uh, for this type of um, uh, application is that um, obviously we are not, this is not a technique to define the absolute location of uh, one event and the absolute location of the other event. We're only recovering the relative uh, distance between uh, locations, okay? So we would have to use some other technique to uh, place at least, I mean, or uh, to place one of the sources and potentially, um, you know, shift uh, this cloud of deduced source displacements uh, relative to that fixed point. Um, a second uh, limitation is uh, comes from uh, the assumptions in the um, uh, quota wave source separation theory developed by Snyder, and that is that um, uh, the the um, all all these uh, sources that are observed here um, they need to to have the same um, a similarity in the source mechanism. Okay, um, in other words. Um, we, if we have a bunch of records here, uh, that doesn't mean we can just uh, measure the distance between all the records. They would have to obey uh, certain uh, thresholds um, in how similar uh, they are, okay, in, in waveform shape and therefore in, in uh, uh, source mechanism type. And the third limitation uh, concerns the maximum uh, source separation. So um, what um, uh, these researchers found is that after some distance, so uh, after, as I increase R, my, dis uh, my intersource distance, then um, the cross-correlation um, coefficient will plateau to a certain uh, maximum, okay? So it, 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 uh, to a certain minimum, actually, it, it plateaus around around uh, 0 0.7, which means that um, for any larger distance, you know, you really cannot go below 0 0.7, so you would be underestimating uh, the true distance uh, between the two sources. So um, as a rule of thumb, you would use like roughly 0 0.3 times uh, the seismic wavelength as a maximum uh, source separation that you can uh, discern. Um, but now, um, if you uh, use one of the extensions and improvements, which includes a, a, a Bayesian formulation to combine uh, different sources and stations, um, now you are in a position to, you know, use a 0 0.3 from A to B, a 0 0.3 from B to C, C to D, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually characterize source displacements of a system that extends much uh, further than 0 0.3 lambda, okay? And the other, for me, very notable extension to this um, uh, coda wave uh, theory, or, or actually um, uh, um, it, a pushing the limits in this theory, an application is that you can use coda wave and uh, interferometry for source separation uh, using a single station. Okay, and this is what I call uh, like a James Bond moment for seismology. Okay, so imagine you are, um, you, this is you, and you're sitting outside of a room, and then uh, there is one person talking, and then there is another person talking, and then there is another person talking, and somehow by listening to these different people talking one at a time, okay, you can switch this CWI engine and tell where are those people relative to each other, okay? Um, now let's look at some applications of this uh, Kuda wave uh, source uh, separation technique. Uh, so here is, for example, uh, an earthquake uh, location example. Uh, from a synthetic test. So we know uh, from before uh, in a map view where the locations are of our earthquakes. 
uh, because it's a synthetic experiment. And then uh, in red, you can see the um, resolved locations of, um, uh, of the sources through coda wave interferometry. Okay, and, and uh, in this specific optimization, there was no a priori information as to how these sources are uh, distributed. Um, and here we see uh, um, um, an application uh, for uh, a real field application where we are comparing um, uh, um, catalog earthquake locations in gray, okay, and a subset of those um, cataloged um, earthquakes are being uh, resolved with uh, uh, seven stations using coda wave interferometry all the way down to one station. And for me, it's really uh, compelling to see, uh, you know, there is not much change uh, between having one station and seven stations in terms of how well uh, you can locate these events, um, at least in a clustering sense, okay? Um, now I will um, just, want to say what happens if you have both changes in velocity and changes in source location. How is your um, coda wave interferometry going to respond? Um, so this is uh, for like a base case, this is um, your true um, intersource distance divided by your wavelength and your estimated uh, source distance divided by your wavelength from coda wave interferometry. And this is the true, uh, so it's a one-to-one. -one. Um, and this is sort of the locations you can, um, uh, you can deduce, okay? And you see that, you know, things don't work uh, as well once we uh, increase our source separation very much. Um, now, this is uh, for, in a separate uh, numerical example, what happens when we have no change in source separation and we're trying to estimate the change in velocity versus the true change in velocity. And coda wave interferometry theory does remarkably well. Okay, it, there's uh, almost perfect agreement. Now, what if you had um, also a change in velocity and you're trying to to estimate um, intersource distance, okay? Um, because you are uh, using uh, trace stretching technique to align uh, your um, baseline trace and your monitor trace, what is remarkable is that your uh, recovered uh, intersource distances are not that different, if not at all, from, uh, from those um, as if there was no change um, in velocity. However, because when you're changing um, the uh, source distances, you're going to change those waveforms. Now, when you're estimating uh, delta V over V of these changed waveforms, um, your deduced uh, delta V over V values with coda wave interferometry will be more scattered. So you don't get this uh, super resolution as you do when you have no displacement uh, in your sources. Now let's look at what happens to uh, the coda when we have displacement of scatterers. Um, so if you uh, look at the baseline versus monitor trace, um, those will have a very pronounced uh, uh, waveform cha uh, shape change. And if you think about it, um, because you're changing uh, the relative locations of uh, a lot of these scatterers, um, not just, you know, the location, this one extra shot, uh, the, 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 this one um, single uh, first path to the scatter, which is the result of moving uh, your source. So this will generally result in more uh, waveform uh, uh, shape change than the phenomenon of uh, shifting uh, the source location. And what scientists have done is uh, to look at um, a quantity called the wavelength uh, decoherence. So uh, you could uh, use a station pair um, and then look at uh, the cross correlation at the reference state and then the cross correlation at the current state. Uh, let's say this is, um, let's call this the reference and perturbed uh, state and using that uh, uh, decoherence um, uh, estimate, it will tell you, did, it did, did the scatterers uh, change their location a lot or not, okay? But beyond this uh, very um, 
let's say, a, 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 a almost semi-quantitative uh, measure of how much did scatterers change, we can, I mean, we, we can also use CODA to actually assess different contributions of space in this record. So what you want to know is how does this individual uh, scattering movement affect my CODA uh, record? And actually this scatterer movement uh, will affect uh, the entire possibly um, length of my CODA because um, this will only affect, for example, this path in this location, but then perhaps if I have another ray, it will affect another location. Okay. Now, if you um, if you think of the complexity of you know heterogeneous structures in the Earth, and you know trying to assess you know where did all these uh, how do all these contributions map onto the record? It's it's it seems like an impossible problem, right? It's it's far too uh, complex. So in this type of problems. Um, it, it makes sense to, to use a probabilistic wave propagation for framework uh, to try to explain uh, this behavior. And this is where, um, if you remember at the beginning where we talked about multiple scattering and, and different types of um, analytical and numerical models to uh, represent multiple scattering, um, here's uh, when we, where we evoke uh, um, the, the, the mathematics involved in multiple scattering and, and we use uh, the, the radiative transfer equation. And the solution to this equation um, gives us what we call uh, an intensity propagator, okay, which uh, depends on, on uh, your wave speed, um, uh, your distance, between source and receiver and, and the transport mean free, mean free path, which is something like, um, you know, how long does it take? It, it's related to how long would it take uh, from one scatterer before I hit uh, the next scatterer. Um, so this, um, with this intensity propagator, we can describe the probability that a wave has traveled between two points of a medium during time uh, t. Okay, so um, now based on the solution of the radiative um, uh, transfer equation, which describes uh, the intensity pro propagators, uh, we can now define these sensitivity kernels, um, which relate the decoherence measurements uh, from different windows here, uh, or even the velocity change measurements from different uh, windows here, to a local perturbation uh, in, in the actual uh, space. Um, uh, so K is, this expression here is sort of saying, if I am um, observing something between uh, S1 and S2, um, how does my uh, point X0 in space affect my system at time T, okay? And the sensitivity kernel is actually a function of these intensity propagators um, estimated at, um, at different uh, locations uh, in our system. So for example, here we have the intensity uh, propagator between uh, my source S1 and um, the, um, the location X0. Here is the intensity propagator be between um, our source uh, X0 and our uh, receiver uh, S2, for example. So, this is a very uh, powerful picture um, that, that helped me understand what, what these sensitivity kernels tell us in practice. And that is, um, let's again imagine a, a source at S1 and a receiver at S2. So if you look right at the beginning of your time record, you know, things are, have probably bounced around a little bit, but only in a small zone between S1 and S2. But as you wait longer in the time record, you know, things have been bouncing a lot around S1 and S2. So now the sensitivity kernel um, is, has larger values over uh, a broader um, area. And in fact, um, these um, sensitivity kernels uh, can be shown to be defined in both uh, two, uh, two dimensions as well as uh, three dimensions. So how do we uh, solve our problem of 
um, what contribution in space brings uh, what contribution in coda waves, okay? Um, we actually use a linear, uh, a system of linear equations, okay? And, and, and the input data that you're gonna feed this problem is um, either your apparent velocity changes from the different uh, receivers, from the different sources, at different time windows uh, in the quota waves, or uh, in the case of um, um, scatterer uh, location changes, uh, those will be um, uh, estimates uh, or, or measurements of uh, the decoherence between uh, different uh, cross correlations of the coda waves, again, between different receivers and, and different sources and different times in the coda waves. So, so this is your input data. And then the Ford model tells you, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have this G matrix, which consists of these sensitivity kernels, okay? And in the, you know, different, um, um, in the case of, 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 of trying to estimate velocity changes in each cell, these sensitivity kernels are weighted by the lapse time Ti and the surface of the cells. Whereas for um, the case of uh, decoherence, um, that G will be, again, a sensitivity kernel weighted by the velocity, in, uh, oh, by the velocity and surface of the cells. And the, um, the, medium parameters that we're trying to estimate is the change in velocity in each cell or um, the change in scattering cross-section density. And, and, and you'll see um, more about what this means in practice, uh, but essentially it's, it's telling you um, in a cross-section what is the density of, for example, fractures or um, any heterogeneous uh, 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 properties. And that can then be used to, um, uh, to relate and find uh, the actual uh, size of defects. Um, so if we are trying to um, uh, solve for these models parameters from our data, we're doing uh, an inverse problem. In this case, because it is a linear equation, um, it's uh, it's not as bad. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, these researchers uh, did a, um, uh, a least squares uh, inversion to solve for the modeling parameters. Again, using some uh, smoothing and, and uh, simply because it's, it's a, um, a very underdetermined problem, which means um, you have more unknown parameters than you do uh, data. Now, um, now that we've gone through the uh, um, theory of coda wave interferometry, I will present um, uh, some very exciting uh, lab scale and field scale uh, applications. So um, firstly, um, uh, you've already seen uh, this um, estimation of uh, um, velocity change from a, a cooling experiment that was done by Sinkatel. And I already explained uh, the sensitivity of coda wave interferometry uh, relative to, for example, first break uh, picking. And um, this is another experiment uh, this team did of uh, looking at how um, the velocity changed um, with uh, in a differential stress experiment. So you're squashing the rock and um, you know your velocity is going up, your, both your VP and your uh, VS velocity is going up. And then uh, in, in black is, is um, the deduced um, velocity change um, you estimate from coda wave interferometry. And it is between um, VP and, and, and VS change. Now let's look at uh, some applications uh, uh, for source location from CWI. So this is now a, uh, a synthetic study uh, done again by Syncatel uh, 2019, where they use a uh, digital model uh, for a rock sample. And here you're seeing uh, the different uh, velocities and uh, all these uh, scatters and her heterogeneity in the sample. And uh, they're putting in four sensors at either end, uh, at all four ends of the sample. And they're putting in uh, acoustic emissions uh, in a grid uh, within this, uh, within this, within this sample, in this uh, simulation, and what they um, what they estimate is um, 
uh, the relative location of these acoustic emission sources uh, relative to the true source location. And what you're seeing in orange here is uh, um, the cluster, um, source cluster locations from CWI, which are in rather good agreement with the true separation in black. And then in blue, you see the um, uh, source a distance estimation from uh, multilateration, which is a, a more uh, traditional uh, technique to uh, locate uh, sources. Um, so I would just like to uh, uh, flag that uh, we haven't had yet um, a, uh, a an application of quota wave interferometry in acoustic emissions. And this is an uh, ongoing work um, within the Catfield project at the University of Edinburgh. So this is what I am working on, uh, this type of experimental data and whether we can uh, locate uh, the acoustic emissions related to uh, rock deformations. Um, this is a, another interesting uh, lab scale application, this time uh, looking at um, uh, uh, concrete damage monitoring and imaging with uh, decorrelation. So in this case, we have uh, a concrete, uh, um, um, sorry, a, a, a concrete sample and we're, um, we're deforming it uh, using uh, this uh, bearing um, um, and, 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 and um, uh, for like a, as a four point test. So you're loading uh, your sample at the top. And what um, you do is you place um, acoustic sensors on one side and here you're seeing the receivers in blue and your uh, sources in red, which is a pretty sparse um, um, acquisition system. And what then uh, uh, these researchers did was use uh, decorrelation measurements between all these uh, sensors uh, to then uh, solve for these um, uh, um, scattering uh, density cross sections, uh, which I said can be uh, linked to the actual depth of uh, of these fractures. Um, so. Looking here at some of these results, uh, here the, we have the um, cross-section um, scattering density and uh, we have four different samples with uh, different uh, pre-existing cracks and what we see is that um, the, even though it's a very uh, small crack in, in diameter, um, this, um, this technique manages to uh, locate um, the, the zone of, of damage. And uh, as a comment, um, what uh, these researchers uh, say is that if you have a very long um, damage zone, then um, your spatial characterization of damage is not as good, simply because um, you are, um, you are pushing the limits of this theory as, um, as your extension is larger than what they call the, the scattering mean free path. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'll be going from lab scale to sort of big scale. This is actually in between lab and field scale. This is uh, a, uh, a test done on a, on a pretty large uh, concrete beam, so 15 tons. Um, and what they had was um, a, uh, some uh, proper um, wire extensiometers uh, here that could measure um, any type of uh, deformation that was happening. And uh, just C1 and, and C2 were uh, the uh, major, um, the macro cracks that formed uh, during uh, the final stages of the experiment. So this is what, um, what the visual ex, uh, inspection uh, gave us in terms of um, how the cracks look at, at the end of the experiment. Sorry, when I say us, it's me and you that you're watching. I didn't uh, participate in this project. Um, so let's look at 
um, what the CWI work um, application can give us. So um, here we're seeing uh, the uh, changes in um, delta V over V, so the changes in velocity from imaging. So we can actually find changes in velocity spatially, okay? And this is before the macro cracks formed and this is after. So if we look at the top, this is consistent with um, uh, tensile uh, stress and this is consistent with uh, uh, compression. So this is um, in, in good agreement um, with acousto elasticity. And then as soon as we break this, uh, this beam, um, we have this uh, internal stress release. So the, the changes in velocity again um, are responding, but this time they are, uh, they are diminishing. We, we're not really seeing much changes afterwards. Now in terms of the uh, scattering de density changes, what we're seeing is right before we, we start forming our macro cracks, um, we see a, a, an increase in the sigma um, uh, estimates. And then right after we, we have formed the macro cracks, we see a, a peak um, in, 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 in the locations where uh, these, um, these macro cracks uh, have formed. And uh, just to say here, you're seeing um, uh, the experimental versus um, uh, predicted uh, uh, values. Um, let me move it. Right. Um, okay, so now we're again moving uh, to a bigger scale, and now uh, we're looking at um, monitoring uh, mock bridge mock-up bridge at, at the BAM test site in Germany. Um, so what was interesting in this experiment was they didn't have um, active, uh, or at least uh, they didn't uh, um, uh, solely analyze active experiments, but they looked at um, ambient noise records on this beam. And what using a technique of, uh, the technique of ambient noise cross-correlation, uh, they could convert these passive uh, records uh, to almost like a, a, an impulse uh, source experiment, which, which is something like the, uh, the Green's function um, corresponding to this, uh, to this material. So with this uh, mock test, they proved that we can uh, use uh, ambient noise to uh, create this um, uh, active looking experiment, which could then lead to uh, monitoring potentially bridges uh, with ambient noise. And here we have an even larger uh, experiment uh, done uh, on a 230 meter uh, long bridge. And in this case, um, again, uh, they are monitoring uh, ambient noise. Um, because you have these vehicles, uh, they act as a source of seismic uh, vibration. So they, are, they can use those ambient noise records do cross correlation uh, to get them in, in, in the right form as if they're doing an active experiment and then use coda wave interferometry onto the coda waves of these cross correlations uh, to do uh, velocity monitoring of the bridge. And what um, uh, uh, these authors found, Selmer, uh, Selmer Moser et al, was that in fact the, the change in uh, um, uh, the, the change in, um, in, in velocity was very much consistent with um, the temperature variation uh, 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 in, this, uh, in this area. So the, the question, the next challenge in this case would be, okay, we are seeing a velocity variation because of temperature changes. So uh, let's say it's winter versus summer, but can we undo these uh, temperature variations to uncover any further uh, velocity variations, which could be due, for example, to some uh, structural uh, damage or um, future structural damage uh, to, um, to, which is starting uh, to, to cause a problem. 
Um, so this is, I think, uh, their next challenge. And, and potentially, if, they ha if the, the authors conclude that if they had the right uh, precision temperature measurements, then they could um, model the temperature response and then remove it from the data sets. So remove the trend and uncover um, the underlying uh, changes in velocity. Uh, now, going into more uh, field scale uh, applications, uh, more uh, uh, earthquake applications, um, I mentioned um, um, uh, the study of uh, Robinson uh, et al. to look at uh, location of a cluster of earthquakes, and you've seen some of, um, uh, of this of these results in my previous slides. And uh, here I'm also showing an application uh, to look at induced uh, micro seismicity from uh, mining events. So these are now very small earthquakes. And um, uh, these authors, uh, Zhao et al. and Zhao and Curtis, have um, compared um, the coda wave um, and interferometry locations uh, relative to, for example, uh, double difference um, uh, locations, which uh, would uh, require a, a different uh, type of um, uh, spatial coverage in terms of uh, receivers that is not necessarily required uh, for coda wave interferometry. So uh, this is a, uh, let me just see how I'm doing uh, with time. Okay, I'm, I, I'm finishing my applications and we'll move on to the conclusion. So um, here is a field scale application in which um, uh, Obermann et al. tried to monitor earthquake related changes. So they looked at both uh, 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 changes in velocity and changes uh, in scattering density, uh, co-seismically and post-seismically for the Wenchuan um, enormous magnitude uh, 2008 earthquake, okay? And what they find is a clear correlation of uh, the damage, uh, the co-seismic damage and, and post-seismic damage. Um, and the interesting bit was um, using uh, different times in the coda, they could extract uh, information that was, for example, in, in, in this case, related to um, pronounced rainfall uh, versus for other frequencies uh, relative to, uh, sorry, for other windows, um, uh, uh, differences related to the uh, earthquake event per se. Uh, and, and finishing off with a, um, an application to geothermal reservoirs, which are um, I'm a big uh, uh, go-to zone for uh, geophysics and, uh, and monitoring applications. So um, one of the sites, uh, the geothermal sites, is uh, San Gallen. And um, in this case, um, it's a, uh, it's a hydrothermal system, but uh, they were looking at uh, doing some acid sim stimulation, uh, which resulted in some uh, micro seismicity. But afterwards, they had a, a sudden gas leakage into the well, um, and and then they we try they, they tried to um, use coda wave interferometry to see if it would respond to any sort of uh, reservoir changes. And uh, the, others, the authors conclude that it does. So see, here you're seeing um, uh, some source uh, uh, station pair coverage uh, very near to the uh, injection zone. And um, uh, we have a, there, there is a clear um, uh, decorrelation um, signature because of this uh, injection. Uh, and and uh, moving away from uh, uh, from the injection well, uh, there is no such uh, decorrelation um, um, indication. And uh, here are the inverted um, uh, scattering densities, uh, showing again a a, a, a completely uh, uh, um, spatially and temporal um, correlation to the uh, well injection. So this shows further potential uh, in, in uh, reservoir uh, monitoring applications. So to conclude, uh, why do we use uh, coda wave interferometry? So firstly, um, as is with several uh, geophysical techniques, it's a non-invasive monitoring technique. 
okay? And we do not uh, need any previous information on the subsurface to uncover these, uh, these changes, okay? Um, compared to other geophysical and, and seismic applications, uh, it is a cheap alternative perhaps because it requires a uh, few sensors and, and we, we um, we, we saw that even with a one sensor approach, you still get some uh, information, at least for the relative source locations. Um, it can be cast as both an active technique, so you actively uh, record uh, uh, localized sources, or you can use ambient noise, do cross correlations, and get an equivalent passive, uh, convert your passive uh, record to an active, and then do CWI. Um, it uses kinematic and dynamic aspects of CODA um, and, and, and then directly uh, links that uh, to um, stress information and, and, and damage um, information. Um, and, and really these kinematic and dynamic aspects are necessary to um, fully uh, characterize uh, the changes. Um, we saw that it's a multi-scale um, uh, technique, so we can do anything from the lab to the field. Uh, we can use CODA waves uh, uh, to monitor very uh, small changes simply because CODA waves uh, amplify those changes because they sample the medium uh, for a long time. Um, and then uh, it can be used uh, to assess velocity changes, source location changes, and scatter uh, uh, changes. And, and if you have a problem in your mind and you're trying to say, is CODA wave interferometry going to work for it? Um, you would have to cast it as a problem of, does it Im involve velocity change? Does it involve, involve uh, source location change? Does it involve uh, scatter location change? And then you, you have your answer. Um, now, some of the limitations is, obviously you need CODA waves to do it. Uh, and this implies you need to have the right heterogeneity, both in terms of size uh, relative to your uh, source uh, seismic wavelength, but also in terms of uh, contrast. So if there is no contrast, uh, no heterogeneity, you're not going to get CODA, so you can't apply it. Um, in This is an, another point that all this theory has been developed uh, for like a point scatter, so very localized in space, but um, uh, Zhang showed that um, you can also use these techniques in more um, like a 1D uh, layer structure uh, with certain conditions on the uh, receiver geometry. Uh, uh, I, I, um, I, I, I mentioned that um, you know, we use these sensitivity kernels to uh, localize these, this uh, CODA wave information, um, but um, these sensitivity kernels are a function of the source, receiver, and scatterer locations. So you would have to cleverly think, how am I going to put my sources? How am I going to put my receivers uh, to optimize uh, the information that these uh, sensitivity kernels uh, carry? Um, I mentioned that the sensitivity of monitoring is very large, but remember also it's bounded, which means that, you know, if you have, I don't know, like a tiny, tiny change, uh, and what, when I say tiny, tiny change, it means in a more quantitative sense, uh, what is that time lapse change uh, versus, you know, signal to noise uh, levels and in the baseline and monitor uh, traces. So you would need to consider that. Uh, with this, I'm, I would like to end my talk. Um, I would say CODA wave interferometry, watch this space and um, that the moon is the limit. And uh, in fact, it is because um, these uh, researchers have also used uh, CODA wave interferometry on uh, lunar data. Uh, so they were able to um, uh, apply it on a, another um, um, application. Uh, thank you very much um, to uh, uh, SCG Women's Network.
Um, and special thanks to uh, Mingi Wong uh, for the invitation and uh, Shelley Oakley and Renee Richards uh, for organizing the seminar. Thank you. And sorry for going over time.